I actually, let's see. I can't answer them. I don't know why, but uh, oh, maybe if uh, I click so. Anyway, we're, we're live, so. <laughs> okay. Hey, everybody. I'm Mark Fraunfelder from Make Magazine. You can find out more about Make and read hundreds of great technology project how-tos at makezine.com. My guest today is Bree Pettis. In 2009, Bree co-founded a 3D printing company in Brooklyn, New York with partners Adam Mayer and Zach Smith. They called it MakerBot. Their first 3D printer introduced in March 2009 was called the Cupcake, and it gave many people their first glimpse at what a 3D printer is and what it can do. At the 2010 World Maker Fair in New York, MakerBot introduced the Thingomatic, which had many improvements over the Cupcake. Then, in 2012, MakerBot released the Replicator, followed shortly thereafter by the Replicator 2. This new printer featured double the build envelope of the Thingomatic and has an impressive 100 micron layer resolution, which means that each layer of plastic laid down is about as thick as a sheet of paper. MakerBot's newest 3D printer is called the Replicator 2X, which offers dual extruders for multicolor printing possibilities. MakerBot's latest product is the Digitizer, a 3D scanner that makes 3D models of physical objects. With a digitizer and a 3D printer, you have something like a 3D copy machine. In June of this year, Stratasys acquired MakerBot. So, Bree, it's great to, uh, to see you again. It's been a while since we've had a chance to chat. Yeah. Um, it's fun because uh, I met you at Make Magazine. You were making... Uh, terrific series of videos for us, the Weekend Projects magazine, and you have like this great sense of, of energy and enthusiasm. I think you were a school teacher, is that right? Yeah, you know, it was interesting, and like I started messing around with video in 2004, 2005, and then was the first Maker Faire 2005 or 2006? Um, I believe it was 2006. So in 2006, I ended up coming down and going to the first Maker Faire and Dale basically said, like, well, um, uh, Peskovitz actually said, like, can you please coordinate this maker video thing, and we'll bring all the best videos from the internet around making things. And um, so I did that, and I also, you know, Maker Fair was like eight hours a day, and I think it says total 16 hours, and I, I shot like 12 hours of video in those 16 hours, just doing portraits of makers who were making things and and how they did it. You know, some guy brought his like. Um, electric motorcycle, and I shot that, and and then I, I just cranked those things out, and the next thing you know, Dale was paying me more than I was making as a teacher to be making videos part time. So, <laughs> um, at the end of that year, I left teaching and started making videos for Make, and I set, the, I sort of, uh, you know, looking back, I I set myself up sort of an insane, you know, challenge of making a video. I'd have to post, I post a video every Friday for almost two years. That's a ton I, of work. Yeah, so I produced it, starred in it, edited it, and somehow managed to get it out at noon on Friday. And, uh, and I, you know, I just got this whole, like, you know, iteration, obsessive kind of thing. I actually ended up writing the Cult of Done manifesto based on that work of having to get something done every week. Because when you have to do that, you learn, like, how powerful iteration is and and when you apply it to pretty much anything but for me it was like okay I'm cranking work out there and you know when you it just it was awesome it was <laughs> a great couple of years. and I, I think you you kind of discovered that you are a a natural uh, storyteller and explainer of things you ended up doing a pilot for the history channel that I loved it was was it something about like the history of science it was called History Hacker, and the idea was I would take inventions from the past and remake them out of stuff from my closet. That's such a cool idea. I, I am uh, really <laughs> sorry that it didn't turn into a series, but in a way, it's a good thing. I mean, um, what year did you do the, the History Hacker pilot? So, let's see. So, I worked for Make for 2006 and 2007. In 2008, I worked for Etsy, and so I did the pilot during that year. That's also the year that really I started up NYC Resistor and got that rolling mm -hmm. as well. And, and NYC Resistor is a is a hacker space. Yeah. And uh, so so that's the period that I'm I don't really know your story from there. So after History Hacker, you started NYC Resistor. Tell me about why you decided to focus on 
co-founding a 3D printing company. So I think I have to kind of step back a little bit and say, you know, I, I moved from Seattle where I had a group of, of hackers called, at, called HackerBot Labs. And I didn't have that in New York. So I, I kind of put together a honeypot of the, the NYC Resistor microcontroller study group. And it was just basically a show and tell where folks working on, this is pre-Arduino, so it was like people using microcontrollers to do cool stuff would get together and, and show off what they were doing. And, uh, and from that group of kind of that, like, Get together group. We the nine of us ended up starting NYC Resistor by each putting in a thousand bucks, you know, for rent and deposit and all that. And um, one of those guys was Zach Smith, who had been working on the RepRap project. And I had actually in 2007, when I met him, had actually got inspired and done a bunch of weekend projects about how to make a what was then a rep strap, a McWire bot, which was an ultra primitive 3D printer made out of plumbing material plumbing pipes, and uh, and he kept hacking on it, and then, you know, I ended up, you know, basically, I, you know, basically we just realized that there was, it was going to be interesting, so, you know, I had just quit my job at Etsy, he had just quit his job at Vimeo, we got Adam involved, it took Adam like five or six months to actually quit his job at, uh, an educational software company around here. So, you know, and when we started, we, it, we really thought of it as a project, not necessarily a product. We thought, you know, this is really hard. It would be nice if there was just one, you know, structure, one 3D printer that everybody could hack on so that it could be, so it could be, so we could actually, like, have one that would work. Because we'd been working for, you know, we'd made a bunch of machines, but they, they all were different variations of not working. So... <laughs> Getting the, uh, getting the, you know, we, when, when we started the company in January 2009 and we just really didn't sleep very much for a few months, just iterating, iterating, iterating until we came out with a prototype. So I've actually got here, um, you know, we had this machine right here. It's really, it's a little too small. It's really sketchy. But it actually, you know, it's kind of like the uh, car in the garage. It, I parked it working. So in theory, it still works. <laughs> um, and, it, and I took it to South by Southwest and launched the company and, and launched the product. And, you know, we thought we'd make 20 of them and it would take a few months for them to sell. And instead, they basically sold out instantly. So we had that great problem of, of sort of instant success. Uh, um, and so you started just selling uh, a box with components in it. And, yes, and, yeah. And told people to make. So when you started this, you did not expect that you would have to become a a business person, which is what you've kind of ended up doing. Yeah, I mean, I really expected, when we started it, I think it's kind of, uh, you know, most people think it just immediately jumped into life, but it was, you know, I I was thinking I was going to do more TV stuff, I, was, I had other things I wanted to do, but once we got the machine working, it was clear, like, this was, there just wasn't, you know, anything else to do. We had to keep pushing on this. We had to make it better. And it went from being something like, you know, before we started the company, we were like, yeah, maybe this will take like 10 hours out of our week. To as soon as we started the company and got a prototype working, we were like, you know, I don't know, all the hours in a week. <laughs> How many people are at MakerBot now? So we're about 330 now. And do you all do, you do all the manufacturing there in, in Brooklyn? Yeah, so right now we're in the MakerBot you know, HQ offices and about... Two or three miles that way are, is our manufacturing facility, the, the MakerBot factory. What have you learned about doing essentially the solo kind of projects that you were doing for, for Make, the, the weekend projects that you, like you said, you did everything yourself, the start in them, produced them, edited them, to managing a company that has 300 employees? So, um, you know, I can say that nobody is born knowing how to do this, and, and, and it's not, you know, I'm not a, I don't think anybody's a natural at, at managing a company. So it's been just a, you know, I've just had to become who the company needed to make it work as we grew. So, you know, I was the marketing department for the first three years. I was the support department for the first three years. If you send a letter, to, if you send an email to MakerBot in the first two or three years, I answered it. Um, so I think, you know, 
when you have a passion, when you have a company, you just do everything you can to make it work, and that's what we did. And for me personally, it's been a huge growing experience to to go from making individual projects to collaborating with you know, 330 people to make stuff work. Oh yeah. Um, so earlier this year in June, like I said, you were acquired by Stratasys, and and yep. uh, uh, w which was a, a really nice uh, sale. You got got a, a great amount of stock, and it, it's a testament to what a company you built and what a great product you've developed. Um, could could you tell me the reason why you sold it to uh, Stratasys, or why you were acquired by Stratasys, and and how that's uh, going to help you? Uh, uh, kind of outpace the competition. So, for us, you know, when you know, we started with this, we started before Kickstarter, so we had to give up equity in the company to get our original 75k. And then, as we grew, we needed more equity so we could continue to develop the the machines. And so, we took, I, I raised 1.2 million dollars from angel investors around New York City and and actually around the world. And then. Um, in 2011, I raised $10 million from uh, venture capitalists, um, the best venture capitalists. But when you do that, you, you're, 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 making a, you're making a promise. You're saying, you're going to give me money so I can grow the company. And in return, at some point, what you invested is going to be more, worth more than you put in. And the way that you can make that happen is you can sell the company, you can go public, and I guess you could you could you could fail as well. Um, so we actually did two things. We 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 merged with Stratasys, and also and that that was an acquisition. But we also became a public company because Stratasys is public. So we sort of in, in startup culture, this is the uh, this is the this is the progression of how things work. So. You know, we I had been on track to go, uh, you know, to go out and raise another raise another round, um, but in the middle of it, Stratasys expressed an interest, and because they're sort of the grandfathers in the space, and uh, we 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 they were really the only people we would have considered merging with, and uh, they're also just good people, so we we just got you know got into the thick of it, negotiated it, made it work. And now we're, um, you know, it's interesting. We get resources now. Rather than me going out and raising money, I have resources of a public company to, to dip into. And, you know, we actually, one of the things that's, that I don't know if many people realize, but we spent, you know, at MakerBot, we spent a lot of time routing around the IP of, of the big companies. Um, and there's, there's probably around eight patents that we had to work really hard to work around to make to be able to have our product that we couldn't have that now we don't have to stress out as much about. So we actually get access to IP that we didn't have before. Is that because Stratasys holds those patents, or they're able to, uh, to yeah. license them? Stratasys has about 800 patents in the space. Uh, oh, in the space! Wow. Um, and there there are some other patents that are going to uh, expire that I don't know if Stratasys owns or not, such as as laser centering. Um, that's uh, that's three D system stuff, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, are you looking at that kind of thing, like uh, when when some of these some of these three D pads are going to expire? How you might incorporate them into what you're doing? Yeah, I mean it's interesting. From the beginning, we we can only do what we did because the original F, the original the original patent expired. But there's ever, since then there's been a lot more patents. So it's uh, you know it's one of those things where. We had to decide early on that we were going to be a sustainable company and that we were going to grow and we were eventually going to be a big company and so we had to invest in IP because it's a really weird, you know, the, the patent system is really weird and it's the, the way you actually want to end up with that is you want to end up in a, like, a, you want to basically have enough IP that you can survive. And um, so we got we have some you know we 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 have a patent on our automated build platform we have some networking patents we have some interesting stuff that uh, allowed that, that basically allowed us to get ready if we ever had to if we ever had to like go head to head with anybody but the acquisition sort of solved that as well so it great. turned out it turned out really well for everybody great um, so Bree um, I I know that. 
the clock is ticking, and, and one of the things that I'm really excited about learning uh, more about is the the digitizer that you recently yeah. an announced, and it's uh, like it's a great compliment to what a 3D printer is. Why don't you uh, talk about that a little bit? And if you have something to show us, I'd love to see it. Sure. So I really wanted to have a 3D scanner, and we did some early work. We had actually a, um, we had a product called the MakerBot Cyclops, which we actually we couldn't use that name. It turned out that there was a somewhat obscure scanning project called that, and we got a trademark. They, they sent us a trademark, like a takedown letter, so we had to change the name of that. But... Um, Cyclops I, is a great name. I know. <laughs> oh, and it used a PS3i and a, and a oh, Pico man. projector. But it wasn't very good, and the UI was, was horrible, and it was really for people who like, could use like, command line software. And when we, want, but when we started working on the, rep, on the, on the digitizer, you know, we wanted something that would be easy, that would get the job done, and would be something that would be as affordable as possible. You know, and what was out there started at about $3,000 and went up. And uh, and it turns out that the hardware on this is not terribly hard. You've got a turntable here that moves around. You've got two lasers here, which are actually nice line lasers. Um, quality does matter on those. And then you've got a you've got a webcam and a really fancy filter, which actually filters for 600 nan 650 nanometers. So it, the idea is that the, the camera will only see the color of the laser line. And uh, it, it's a really nice package. You've got your, uh, your on and off switch here and some status lights and your, your USB connector. And it's just a, it's a beautiful machine. I'm really proud of it. I can show you also the prototype. You know, when we started this, I basically put together a little bit, a little skunk works group to come up with something. And this was the, the prototype. And uh, I showed this at C at uh, South by Southwest. But it's very similar. You know, you've got all the parts here. This turns. You've got a bunch of you know laser cut and 3D printed parts to to make it work. Uh, and this this camera is actually a pretty fancy camera. You've got the electronics over here, and that all adds up to basically being the basic idea. Now we were we did we finished this last July, like a year ago July, and then it took us about that long to develop it from a project into a product. You know. When you're dealing with pieces like these, these are big injection molded pieces. You know, some of these pieces, the, the tooling for these pieces costs more than a hundred grand. So, and there's a lot of pieces here. So, when you make things like this, you can only you have you can only really justify doing that when you know you're gonna gonna sell tens of thousands of them. Mm -hmm. um, if you're not gonna do that, you might as well stick with laser cut wood and and parts. Um, so, you know, I, it, one of the cool things about this is it's also made for manufacturing. So the, uh, the screws on this are all on the top so that it never needs to be flipped over. There's, there's little tricks like that that mean that we can just crank these things out. That's cool. So can you show me an example of something that has been scanned and then 3D printed on a replicator? So I've got lots of stuff. So here's something fun. So this is a, this is a shell from the beach. And here's the 3D printed friend here. That's so, great. Yeah. What kind of really? resolution does does it offer? The same kind of resolution that the Replicator 2 has, that that hundred micron. Yeah. So it's interesting. The way the resolution works on the scanner is because it turns and the laser fires at it. The resolution is almost, is a radial resolution. It actually does 800 different points around a circle. So it's Excuse me. While the the layer resolution is important on a on a MakerBot replicator too, the radial resolution is what's important on the uh, on the digitizer. And so it ends up with a, a you end up with a model that's more than two uh, usually more than two hundred thousand polygons, which is pretty darn good. So you know, I actually did a little thing here where I I printed we made and designed this this little gnome here, and this is printed out on a MakerBot. And then we scanned it, and you end up with this. So I'm kind of trying to hold them. And you can kind of see that this one right here, you can see a little bit more beard detail there. Mm -hmm. but on this one, it's a little bit smoothed out. So it's accurate, but it's a little bit, you lose a little bit of detail on when you do scan. It's kind of like photocopying. Now, I, sure. I should really scan this and then, event, and then 
print it and scan it and print it. <laughs> I'll end up with that like photocopy a photocopy kind of. Yeah, thing. that would look good. You'd end up with just a blob at the end. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've got something else here. So this is really cool. So this is um, my uh, my guy, uh, a guy who works here, Robert, had originally wanted to make a a table that had these at the base of it, these fish at the base mm -hmm. of it. And this is actually uh, it's a plaster sculpture that he had made based on a, a lamp post he, he saw in Paris. So it turns out this is a plaster is actually a great thing to scan because it's not reflective. So this is the 3D model. And you can see with if I do this, you, you lose a little bit of the detail around the eyes. And because it couldn't see this part right here, it had to fill it in. It has a spe it has an algorithm that fills in parts it can't see. So Usually that turns out okay. Sometimes it gets a little funky, so it's definitely a, a try it and get there kind of a thing, but I'm pretty sure. happy with the way this turned out. So once you make your 3D model, can you go in and, and modify it so that you can add detail? Oh, yeah. There's actually uh, there's a couple programs that you can use. The, the, probably the easiest and, and cheapest one is one called uh, Mesh Mixer. So it's a, something that Autodesk has. And you just literally go in and you kind of wiggle on it and it makes ridges or details or creases and it lets you do simple modifications. Of course, you can go crazy. You can, you can modify stuff as much as you want. We've, got a, we've actually currently got a, um, a gnome modification challenge where you take this gnome and you modify it on Thingiverse. I think there's a few more days left if people want to take that model and do something wonderful, you know, kind of uh, change it, mash, do a mashup with it. Uh, we're, we're seeing some pretty, pretty cool stuff happen there. That sounds fun. And, and Thingiverse, uh, for, for people who are unfamiliar with it, is a uh, 3D model repository where people can upload the, their 3D models that they've created and let other people download them, print them out, and modify them. Is that accurate? Yeah. Thingiverse That's is my favorite place to go every morning and see the new things that you can make today that you couldn't make yesterday. And the community is just amazing. Like, people just upload the most amazing stuff there. Are there new things every day? There's like 150 or 200 new things every day. It's, you know, when we started it, we actually started Thingiverse before MakerBot. We would, you know, I think we would get like, we would be lucky if we got one thing a day. And now we're at like hundreds of, more than 100 a day of things uploaded to Thingiverse. So it's, it's, an, exci it's an exciting time if you're into 3D stuff. Yeah, definitely. Um, so uh, we've been talking a little bit about software, and that's something that I wanted to ask you about because um, from my own limited experience with 3D printers, I have found that the, the biggest challenge is just figuring out how to use the software. There doesn't seem to me that there is a standalone package that lets you design and print, um, and there's just a, a kind of clunkiness that reminds me when I had uh, a DOS computer uh, circa 1989 or something. So I agree with you. It's I mean I think that if you you know you can use the high end stuff like AutoCAD and SolidWorks, or you can use the free stuff like uh, like like Mesh Mixer and One Two Three D and Tinkercad. You know I think that there's room for improvement there. I think and I think actually what I I, I like what One Two Three D is doing. Of all those, I like what the one two three D suite the best. But you know, on Thingiverse, we actually saw this, and we we created a way for people to. It's called the customizer for people to use um, OpenSCAD to make parametric objects. So you can make a, you can make a, you can make a Nokia cell phone case, and then you just have to type in your name, and it'll or you type in your Twitter handle, and it'll put that on the case. So there's kind of we're doing a bunch of kind of like sort of application level design tools, I think mm -hmm. that that's going to be pretty popular going forward. And, and so do you work closely with uh, the software developers so that they can make things that, uh, so that they can create software that works really well with what you're doing? Yeah, I mean, if you use MakerBot MakerWare, which is the MakerBot software, we, we put a lot of energy and time and, and actual money into developing that so that it would be easy and friendly and and as painless as possible to take your model and put it in there, set it up on a virtual build plate, and then print it out on a MakerBot. That's, I think that that's actually one of the, the things that is 
it, you know, besides having a great machine with the MakerBot Replicator 2, the, the software is one of the things that really establishes it as just a, 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 pro, a prosumer level device. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, that's an, an interesting question too. Um, your, mar your market, or your audience that MakerBot is serving, do you think that it's changed? At, at, at the beginning with the cupcake, of course, you were like serving the early adopter, leading edge people. Yeah. Um, and the, I imagine that the majority of your users now are not the same kind of person. Do you feel that you're going to continue to serve both of those kinds of audiences? Is, that, is it a challenge? Is it possible? Is it easy? You know, the way I look at it is we need to make machines that are good enough for professionals to have on their desk, but friendly enough for everybody else. So, I mean, we just did a, you know, we're actually about to launch a video where we did a, we, where we, about, um, a project that Lockheed Martin did for the next generation space next the next generation Hubble, Hubble telescope, where they used a MakerBot to, you know, possibly save up to six months of time and and around a million dollars, just by having a MakerBot that could because it, they could iterate quickly, they could get stuff done, and it's interesting the the telescope was actually in a cryo chamber, and they wanted to do something to it, and they had to wait till it was out, but they didn't have to wait because they just printed out the part of the telescope that they wanted to work on, and then they were able to do all their testing and prototyping and, and try it all out on a MakerBotted model. And then when it came out of the cryo chamber, they were able to do the, the procedure really quickly. You know, it's things like that where it's like, you know, kind of good enough for space exploration, but friendly enough for everybody else. <laughs> No. That's great. Yeah, to me, I think that the magic thing about 3D printing is being able to iterate. I think back That's when I was a mechanical engineer in the, uh, in the mid to late 80s, I was a described development engineer. And, and if I was designing like I, a component, like say the, the cover for the base plate for a disk drive, and I wanted to make a form and fit prototype, I would design it in a CAD system, copy it to a floppy disk, drive it across town to the, the model shop, the guy would like yep. transfer the tool paths, he would call me and say, oh, you messed something up, I'd drive, you know, drive back a new thing. Yeah. It would take him like a week to get, I'd drive back. And so that, that iteration would take me often two weeks. You'd, find, you'd always find mistakes. What the 3D printers do is it allows you to make lots of mistakes and get them out of the way really quickly. I mean, that, that is like a huge, huge game changer for, for product development. You know, you say it, and it's it's true. I think people don't understand how powerful that is. I mean, I think it, back in the day, two weeks was actually really, really fast turnaround. Yeah, it was. Um, it used, that was like I mean, a rush job. Was probably a little more reasonable. And so you're thinking like, okay, you can iterate multiple times a year, whereas mm -hmm. when you have a MakerBot on your desk, you can iterate multiple times a day. And that means that the products that you make, like, Engineers can make stuff, and if they don't like the way it looks, they can throw it away and make another one without even having to show their boss. So it's uh, it just yeah, we're just gonna have better products because people can iterate faster. And and I, it's also I would say like iteration is also one part lifestyle. When you realize that you can iterate and that you can fail faster and that failing isn't as stressful, it changes the way you think about the world. It allows you to. Think of failure as something that's part of the process. It's a natural part of the process, instead of something that we, you know, you might take personally and feel horrible about it. When you when you accept iteration, you just accept that you are gonna fail, and you might as well get it out of the way as many times as possible so you can get to where you want to go. That's that's so true. Um, in in the book I wrote, Made by Hand, I I said that um, when you uh. Are, are making mistakes. Uh, you, you should never like intentionally try to make a mistake. You should always try to do your best. <laughs> yeah. Like, you have to accept mistakes and realize that mistakes are a good thing because that means you're learning, you're improving, you're getting things out of the way. And uh, 3D printers are like such an amazing tool for getting lots of getting your mistakes made quickly. I think you you hit the nail on the head there. That you know it's cool that you know. Having a MakerBot in your life means you can make all sorts of wonderful stuff, and it's a magical experience. But once you absorb that idea that you can try and try again, and it's okay, and it's not too, it's not, it's it's affordable, and you can just keep going. It's just super powerful. Yeah. 
So, Bree, this our, our time is up. I can't believe how fast the time went, but this has been so much fun catching up with you and uh, finding out what you're up to. Uh, I, I love what you're doing. The digitizer is awesome. I, I can't wait to get my hands on one. Well, it's, it's a pleasure talking to you, too. I mean, it's uh, we've known each other. I was thinking about it. We've known each other a long time. This is... Yeah, coming, I think, maybe 10 years, probably. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I remember I was an active commenter on Boing Boing back in the day, and, you know, I was having my students read Corey's work, and, you know, then I'd post about it on the school blog, and Corey would, like, comment on my blog posts about my classroom, like... You know, I have to say, like, Boing Boing, you're turning 25, and you've just had such a powerful effect on the world by showcasing and putting a spotlight on all sorts of wonderful and weird things. Oh, well, keep, cool. Like, keep going. Sounds good. Thanks so much, Bree, and you keep going, too. All right. I look we'll forward to you seeing later. you soon. Okay. Bye-bye.